for, for being here. Mexico has long been an important ally and friend of the United States. It is this country's third largest trading partner, has one of the largest economies in the Americas, and remains the third largest source of foreign oil for the United States market. Unfortunately, over the past few years, organized crime has made Mexico a major producing and transit state of illegal drugs trafficked into the U.S. As long as much as 90 percent of all cocaine entering the United States comes through Mexico. Criminals in Mexico are now the largest foreign suppliers of marijuana and major suppliers of methamphetamine. Apparently crime pays. This criminal enterprise is estimated to produce annual revenues ranging from 25 to 40 billion. In December 2006, shortly after taking office, Mexican President Felipe Calderon began a major crackdown on the drug cartels operating in his country. Since then, almost 11,000 people in Mexico have been killed in drug-related violence. Almost daily reports from Mexico depict, depict killings, acts of torture, and kidnapping. And it is getting worse. This past June, was the deadliest month on record, with over 800 killed in drug-related violence. In short, in Mexico, drugs and violence are a growth industry. As a result, Mexico is facing one of the most critical security challenges in its history. Many who have had the courage to confront the drug cartels have been threatened or killed. This includes policemen, soldiers, judges, journalists, and even the clergy. However, there is some basis for optimism. The courageous efforts of President Calderon have resulted in important changes. Law enforcement agencies and other federal officials have reported positive developments in their working relationships with the Mexican counterparts. They say, these changes are having a significant effect in addressing the drug threats posed to both countries. At the same time, there's a front page article in today's Washington Post which reads, Mexico accused of torture in drug war, army using brutality to fight trafficking. As the effort in Mexico to address the drug threat continues, we must be clear that abuses from the state are equally intolerable. I will seek to understand more about the facts relating to this article as the committee's investigation continues. Nevertheless, I believe the drug cartel and their associated violence constitute a major threat to security and safety along the southwest border. And I have caused major and have caused major disruptions to commercial activities, including international trade. Because of my growing concerns about this problem, I sent a bipartisan team of committee investigators to the southwest border to get a first-hand look at what is happening on the ground. Our investigators met with numerous federal, state, and local officials, including law enforcement, military intelligence, and others and observe field operations in both daylight and night. This hearing was designed as a follow-up to the staff field investigation to provide the committee with an overview of federal efforts to disrupt and dismantle the Mexican drug trade and to examine whether federal agencies have sufficient tools and capabilities to do the job required. Over the past few years, there have been nagging questions about the effectiveness of federal policy with regard to the southwest border. While it is clear that the, this administration takes the drug cartel threat very, very seriously, questions remain, though. Just one month ago, the administration published a document entitled National Southwest Border Counter-Narcotics Strategy. 
This is a blueprint on how the administration will address the threats posed by Mexican drug smuggling. But the key issue remains, who is in charge? We know who is leading the fight in Iraq. We know who's leading the fight in Afghanistan. What we don't know is who is leading the fight on our own border. Is it the border czar? Is it the drug czar? Will it be the National Guard? Perhaps we will obtain a better understanding of this question today. One more thing before we begin. With us today are top representatives from key law enforcement agencies involved in the ongoing struggle to address the Mexican drug trafficking. The work they do is critical both to United States national security and to helping Mexico in its progress to turning the corner on the threats it now confronts. I commend their efforts and I look forward to working with them on this critical national security matter. Thank you. Before I recognize uh, my ranking member, Mr. Issa, for his opening statement, I would like to thank the minority for its assistance during this investigation. And all of the work related to today's hearing was conducted on a bipartisan basis. I would like to thank the ranking member for his leadership and he has, and his staff for continuing to build on this important relationship. I look forward to continuing to work together on important matters such as today's topic. I will now yield to the ranking member, Mr. Darrell Issa, for his opening statement. Congressman Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, but I would have let you go on as long as you wanted on that track. <laughs> as the chairman said, this is a bipartisan issue, and it's one in which there is no distance uh, between the chairman and myself. Our staffs did work closely on it and intend to continue. There's no surprise that uh, we will reach different conclusions on some of the fixes and some of the things that should be done. We certainly uh, will reach some differences in the uh, priorities of the administration, including its representatives before us today and uh, the two of us. But when it comes to finding the facts and to agreeing on the portions that can be agreed on so that we can then disagree on very little, I think this committee is setting a high standard and I intend to continue that. As Chairman, I ask unanimous consent that my entire uh, opening statement be placed in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. And, and with that indulgence, uh, I'll take a moment to, uh, to recognize uh, Alan Burson. Uh, I don't know the rest of you as well, but uh, uh, our new border czar is not new to San Diego and he's not new to dealing with border issues. His work as a U.S. attorney, his work in education, his work on the airport. Uh, Alan, the list of work is too long to, to do as an introduction, but you've been a champion for so many causes in San Diego, and I couldn't be more delighted that the president has selected you as somebody that rises above politics, rises above either party uh, to do what's right for our country. So I, I look forward to your testimony today. and. And, and, I'm, and I'm particularly pleased that the border as a separate issue is getting uh, attention. I must admit that the reduction of the uh, drug czar from a full cabinet level position concerns me deeply. I think it sends the wrong message at a time in which your efforts and the efforts of the Mexican government are going to be critical. And the fact that we pulled away uh, two and a half years ago from Plan Colombia. We curtailed our support for uh, Plan Colombia and then on a very partisan basis failed to support the Colombian Free Trade Initiative. Sends a chilling message to countries who bled so long with us in order to eradicate drugs that once literally controlled the government in Colombia. Today in Mexico, we have a, a very brave president who is fighting the same battle and so far appears to be making progress. I say that because you're only one key assassination away from a dramatic change in Mexico and that we need to understand that. We need to understand that the depth of corruption in Mexico, which has often been well understood when it's in the hands of people with guns, and willingness to use them, 11,000 or so murders this year alone, says a great deal. We're going to hear today about the 
spillover or lack thereof. And I believe as a San Diegan that people in San Diego at the border, the U.S. attorney and others, are doing a good job of doing everything they can to ensure that the activity north of the border is disconnected as much as possible from the activity south of the border. But let's be clear. Whether you're in San Diego or St. Louis or Cleveland, you are directly affected by our failure to stop narcotics from coming into our country. Every city in America and many rural areas have organized crime directly linked to those assets being made available and sold. Some in my party would, would say that it's another country's uh, problem alone. I am not one of them. Today, with former Speaker Denny Hastert, we announced with many members from this uh, committee a drug task force, one that had been somewhat dormant for uh, several years because we felt that we needed to work hard to bring new emphasis to this growing problem, but also because we want to make sure that the facts are very clearly stated to the American people. First of all, we are the consumers and we are the suppliers of money. We all take a certain amount of blame for the fact that our money ultimately leads to these cartels' operations in other countries. Additionally, we're going to hear today about guns going south while drugs go north. I have no doubt that drugs do go south. One of the questions is, is it through the tunnels that I have seen personally that move the drugs, or is it somehow through the border? Would we, in fact, do any real good if we set up a exiting American checkpoint at the border, or it would simply be one more burden borne by uh, our Border Patrol people at a cost much higher than either the Mexicans doing their job, or, in fact, would we accomplish very little other than to find uh, a small amount of drugs and a small amount of paraphernalia when, in fact, anything serious in the way of guns or other activities are probably going through the very means that bring drugs north are also sending things south. And if we didn't find the drugs going north, we're just as unlikely to find the, the guns going south. Having said that, I look forward to an awful lot of information we don't have every day in San Diego. And I again want to thank the chairman because the only way we're going to really support the efforts of this administration and hold the administration accountable is on a bipartisan basis. We're off to an incredibly good start, and I expect it to continue, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman, Congressman Issa. Uh, I would now like to recognize Mr. Attorney to make an opening statement, uh, if he would like. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you, and I want to thank again our witnesses for being here this morning. In March, the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Policy, Foreign Affairs, uh, had a hearing on the issue of money, guns, and drugs, and whether or not the United States' inputs were fueling violence on the U.S.-Mexican border. At that hearing, we heard testimony about what factors inside the United States are contributing to the strength and cruelty of Mexican drug cartels. The key point that emerged in that hearing, a point that I hope will be explored in more depth here today is that continuing to interdict drugs and smugglers on the border will be an endless task if we don't address the other related aspects of the drug trade. More progress needs to be made in three main areas, guns, cash, and the demand for drugs in the United States. According to some estimates, as many as 90 percent of the high caliber weapons that are being used by drug cartels to perpetrate the violence we've seen in the past several years originate in the United States. We can't hope to quell the violence that has gripped border towns and cities violence that threatens the stability of the Mexican government and the safety of our own citizens on the southern border if we do not halt the flow of arms into Mexico. This is a significant challenge for law enforcement and border patrol. In many cases, the manufacture and purchase of these weapons may not be illegal. That means we have to check the gun flow at the border as well as in the interior of this country. A second major <coughs> factor in the drug trade and the rise of powerful drug cartels is the cash flow coming in from the United States. We heard testimony at the March hearing that as much as $25 billion in bulk cash flows into Mexico from drug sales in the United States each year. One of our witnesses testified that federal law enforcement is hampered by its efforts to find and stop these cash flows by what he called antiquated legislation. It also appeared that there may be a lack of coordination between the various agencies that have jurisdiction in this area. I hope our witnesses today can address those issues in more detail as well. Finally, we must address the fact that it is the demand for drugs here in the United States that has allowed Mexican cartels to become profitable. 
According to some estimates, 90% of the cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, easier to say than use, I suppose, methamphetamine, thank you, and marijuana purchased and consumed in the United States enters our country through Mexico. Americans spend as much as $65 billion annually in illegal drugs. There are no simple solutions to the problem, but we need to recognize that our internal drug policies and our success at curbing the use of these illegal substances in the United States can have a profound effect on the stability of our neighboring countries and our own national security. Before closing, I also want to note that there is a global problem, not simply an issue on the United States-Mexican border. After the March hearing, we had testimony that cocaine from Mexican cartels is now headed to Europe and to Russia. In addition, Mexican and Colombian drug cartels have made inroads in West Africa. Our shared border with Mexico makes the situation there of particular concern to us, but it is just one piece of a global puzzle. I hope that our discussion here today can inform our approach to the other regions as well. So again, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank our witnesses. Thank you very much, Congressman Turney. And now I yield to uh, Congressman Bill Bray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Chairman, let me just say, as a lifelong resident of the Frontera area, I want to thank you for this hearing. It seems that everybody was talking about wars that are overseas and far away, but we're ignoring our own backyard, where fatalities were skyrocketing, where um, the death rate among law enforcement um, just south of our, our border was, was far beyond anything we'd seen anywhere else in the world. And we just sort of ignored it because it wasn't beyond the uh, radar screen for the media. I want to say apologize to the other two gentlemen because I've got to make a mention of my, my friend, uh, Mr. Burson, who I've just got to say to the administration, there are di disagreements I have. But when it comes to the choice of our, our guy over in San Diego in the western sector, no one could have been be um, a better choice than, than Alan. And I want to thank him for being willing to serve again because uh, – as everyone knows, it's not an easy job. You knew what you were stepping into. And we don't have time for a learning curve here. And I, I want to thank the administration for bringing the man back online. Um, Mr. Chairman, the one thing that I've just got to say is that too often we hear the media talk about the drug cartel, drug cartel. We need to change the terminology to the smuggling cartels because we're talking about um, not only drugs going north, but we're talking about um, uh, guns um, and uh, money coming south. And the same cartel was involved in the illegal alien smuggling. It is all a network and a profiteering. In fact, I've grown up in an area where we got in the habit of seeing illegals being used as the mules for the cartels. And the abuses and the high risk involved with illegal immigrants because of its relationship to the gun money laundering and the drug cartel. So I just want to make sure that we understand that when we talk about this issue, they're all tied together. The cartels have controlled the border and the illegal crossing for much too long, and I'm glad to see us address this. I'm also glad to see this hearing because too many people on our side of the border think this is a problem that is across the border and is not, cro not going to be a threat to the American communities. This is a major threat for all of us along the frontier area on both sides of the border, and I hope I'm able to get you um, photos that I don't think we'll show in public, but just so the members understand how bad this is, when a hospital in my county has somebody walking in with two fingers and say, is there any way to preserve these fingers so that when we get the hostages back, we can sew them back on? When you've got law enforcement that finds two, um, let me just say, the remnants of decapitation, this is the kind of thing that we are having going on in our neighborhoods, not just in Tijuana, but in San, the San Diego County region. It is crossing over, and now's the time to win this battle. And working with Mexico, working with Calderon, and let me say one thing. President Calderon is the bravest elected official I have ever m known, and I think that we've got to give credit to him, and we've got to throw aside our disagreements with Mexico and work with him now, because we either fight this battle on Mexican soil and win it, or we're going to be fighting it on American soil at a much higher cost. And I appreciate the chance to be able to be here today. I yield back. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Bill Bray. Um, I would now like to introduce our first panel of witnesses testifying on today. Uh, Mr. R. Gil Kerlikowski, Director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy, the Executive Office of the President. Mr. Lanny A. Brewer, Assistant Attorney General, Criminal Division, United States Department of Justice. 
And Mr. Alan Burson, who's been praised all morning here. You know, I want you to know that to, to, uh, to have uh, Congressman Bill Bray and, and, of course, Congressman Issa to say something nice about you, you must be great. Assistant Secretary for International Affairs and Special Representative for Border Affairs, Office of International Affairs, United States Department of Homeland Security. Um, let me um, uh, indicate if we hear the bells, but we're going to go as far as we can, members. Uh, let me just swear all of you in. President, we stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. Right, may be seated. Let the record reflect that all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Um, why don't we start with you, um, Mr. Curly Kowski. Am I pronouncing that correctly? It's very good. You're excellent on that. Thank you. <laughs> I practiced all last night. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm honored to be with you and certainly Ranking, ranking Member Issa, all of the committee members that are here today. You know, last month, Secretary Napolitano, Attorney General Holder, and I publicly released the strategy that was referenced by the Chairman. This is a comprehensive interagency plan that was developed by, uh, through the work of the Office of National Drug Control, um, uh, our office, and, and it was done in a, in a way that uh, ensured all of the partners that you see here today uh, being actively involved in it. This is a plan that's not going to sit on a shelf and gather dust, and it's being put into action uh, even as we speak. And it's being done in partnership also uh, with the courageous and dedicated work of uh, Mexico's President Calderon, the investments that the United States government has made, and the commitment of all of the federal agencies and the state and local agencies uh, that we have talked to. To ensure that it's turned into action, the administration will soon be announcing a dedicated interagency working group, which I will lead, uh, to push forward the full and effective implementation of the strategy. And that framework is being developed. We'll provide a public report on the implementation of the strategy as part of the administration's first national drug control strategy, which will be published uh, early next year. As part of my oversight responsibilities, my office uh, recently identified uh, overarching national drug control strategy goals to help guide all of the federal agencies as they develop their policy initiatives, their programmatic efforts, and their budget proposals. Now, over the coming months, ONDCP will be working with the Departments of Homeland Security, Justice, State, Defense, and others to develop cross-agency performance goals and metrics for the Southwest Border Initiative. In addition, uh, as the agencies update their strategic plans, we'll be working with OMB and the departments and the agencies to integrate key southwest border priorities that are identified in the strategy. This is not only going to ensure accountability, but it will make it clear that combating the flow of drugs and money and weapons across the southwest border must be a core element of our nation's approach to the entire drug problem. It's essential that we work together as one team to stop the flow of drugs into our country as well as the southbound flow of bulk currency and weapons that fuel drug cartel violence. And to make headway on the full array of border challenges, the Congress and the administration are going to need to work very closely together. I'm looking forward to uh, working with this committee, and I know that uh, part of the, the focus that you have certainly identified is on accountability, and we're very prepared to answer that. Before I close, I want to take a, a talk for just a moment about how vital it is that the federal government improves its cooperation with state and local partners. I ask the uh, directors of the high-intensity drug trafficking areas to meet with me along the southwest border last month. What the HIDA directors told me and what I believe the members of this committee already know is that our frontline state and local law enforcement partners have been under enormous strain. Bill Lansdowne in San Diego, Bill Collender, who the retiring sheriff of 50-plus years of law enforcement, have been friends for many years, uh, so I listened to this uh, very closely. Uh, although the strain is most acute on the border, as uh, the ranking member mentioned, clearly this is a national problem, and it affected us in Seattle uh, during the nine years that I was police chief, as well as my colleagues in Minnesota uh, and across the country. 
The administration intends to continue uh, to help those law enforcement agencies who need it and that are on the border and also within the interior. And we are going to keep an intense focus on this threat and make a difference. The knowledge of local law enforcement, meaning the state, county, and city, uh, is a great advantage to the work of the federal government. And when it comes to the critical challenge of interdicting the southbound flow of weapons and bulk currency, partnership with those agencies is essential, and I think I can be of great value in that. State and local law enforcement personnel possess unmatched knowledge about the organizations that operate within their jurisdictions every day. Our law enforcement operations are most effective when this knowledge is combined with the skill, technology, and resources that the federal agencies can bring. All of us in this administration are committed to pursuing a truly national approach to the critical problem. Thank you, Chairman Towns. I look forward to answering questions. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Brewer. Uh, Chairman Towns and Ranking Member Issa and members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the Department of Justice's important role in the administration's overall strategy to address the threats posed by the rise of Mexican drug cartels, particularly along our southwest border. The Justice Department's goal is to systematically dismantle these cartels which threaten the national security of our Mexican neighbors, pose an organized crime threat to the United States, and are responsible for much of the scourge of illicit drugs and the increase in violence in Mexico. This issue commands priority at the highest level of the Department's leadership. As you know, on June 5th, Attorney General Holder, Department of Homeland Security Secretary Napolitano, and Office of National Drug Control Policy Director Kurlikowski released President Obama's National Southwest Border Counter-Narcotic Strategy. The strategy is designed to stem the flow of illegal drugs and their illicit proceeds across the southwest border and to reduce the associated crime and violence in the region. I look forward to working with Director Kurlikowski and Assistant Secretary Burson and our many federal, state, local, tribal, and Mexican partners to ensure success of the administration's strategy. The Department, the Justice Department, plays a central role in supporting the National Southwest Border Counter-Narcotic Strategy. The Department's approach to the Mexican drug cartels is to confront them as criminal organizations. To do so, we employ extensive and coordinated intelligence capabilities to target the largest and most dangerous Mexican drug cartels and focus law enforcement resources. Our intelligence-based, prosecutor-led, multi-agency task forces focus our efforts on the investigation, extradition, prosecution, and punishment of key cartel leaders. As the Department has demonstrated in attacking other major criminal enterprises, destroying the leadership and seizing the financial infrastructure of the cartels is critical to dismantling them. Stemming the flows, flow of guns and money from the United States to Mexico is an important aspect of the administration's comprehensive approach to the problem. In concerted efforts with the Department of Homeland Security and other law enforcement entities, we are committed to investigating and prosecuting illegal firearms trafficking and currency smuggling from the United States into Mexico. Another key component to neutralizing the cartels is to work closely with the government of Mexico. The Department plays an important role in implementing the Merida Initiative, including serving as the lead implementer in programs on prosecutorial capacity building, asset forfeiture, extradition training, and forensics. We continue to work closely with Mexico to, to address the issue of cartel-related public corruption, including through investigative assistance. We also work together on extraditions of key cartel leaders and other fugitives. The Calderon administration has taken bold steps to confront this threat, and we are committed to assisting our Mexican partners in this fight. 
We believe that the Department has the right comprehensive and coordinated strategy to disrupt and dismantle the cartels and stem the southbound flow of firearms and cash. The strengths of the Department's approach are illustrated by, for example, the tremendous successes of Operation Accelerator and Project Reckoning, multi-agency, multinational operations targeting the Sinaloa and Gulf cartels. Despite our recent successes, however, we recognize that there is much more work to do. Last month, I traveled to the southwest border along with my friend, Assistant Secretary Burson, and saw the acute challenges that our brave law enforcement personnel confront on a daily basis and how intertwined those challenges are. The Department is committed to working together with our colleagues at ONDCP and DHS, with our state, local, and tribal partners, and with the Government of Mexico to build on what we have done so far, and to develop and implement new and to refresh our strategies. The recently signed MOUs between DEA and ICE and between ATF and ICE are emblematic of our collaborative, coordinated approach to the threats posed by the Mexican drug cartels. By continuing to work together, we can and will rise to the current challenge. Again, thank you for your recognition of this important issue and the opportunity to testify today. And I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Right. Thank you very much. And let me just say that we have uh, votes on the floor and that uh, we will adjourn for one hour and we'll be able to come back, uh, say, 10 minutes after the last vote, just in case we run into some problems over on the floor. But I think we should be back in an hour. And so uh, at that time, we will continue with you, Mr. Burson. We have to vote around here. <laughs>
resulting reportedly in more than 11,000 deaths in the last three and a half years. Our opportunity arises from the historic and courageous efforts, indeed heroic efforts, of the Calderon administration. First, to fully acknowledge the power of the cartels, and second, to willingly confront the stark re reality of systematic corruption that exists in Mexican law enforcement. The United States government has been bold as well, starting with the unqualified acceptance that consumption of drugs on the U.S. side of the border is a major contributing factor to the power and influence of Mexican cartels. For the first time, we view drugs coming north and guns and bulk cash going south as two ends of a single problem. It is not the occasion for finger pointing between Mexico and the United States. The acknowledgement of a shared problem has paved the way for cooperation between DHS along with DOJ and the government of Mexico that would have been unthinkable 10 years ago and even unsayable three years ago. DHS is working in full partnership with the government of Mexico to respond to the dangers and the opportunities that the current crisis has presented. This is a relationship of trust with verification and one that is accepted by both countries on that basis. On March 24th, Secretary Napolitano and Deputy Attorney General David Ogden announced the President's major Southwest border initiative, a reallocation of agents, technology, equipment, and attention, importantly, attention to the border. Those deployments are now complete. DHS has also taken steps to deepen our relationship with partner agencies in the government of Mexico. On June 15th, for example, Secretary Napolitano signed a letter of intent with Mexican Finance Secretary Augustine Carstens to guide the cooperative efforts of CBP, ICE, and Mexican Customs. DHS components also have worked to broaden the bilateral relationship in information and intelligence sharing, as well, in, as, well as in other areas that are law enforcement sensitive. Many have asked me what has changed between my first appointment as so-called border czar and my current job. The security threat on the border is certainly intensified with regard to the activities of the drug and other smuggling cartels that dot the border. However, I note two positive changes within our government that make me optimistic that we will succeed in our efforts to reduce significantly the power of the smuggling cartels. First, DHS provides a significantly better resource capability to confront security issues at the border than was the case previously. It also has a unified chain of command overseeing our investigation and inspection responsibilities. Secondly, and genuinely, I've been impressed by the extent of cooperation that I've witnessed among our federal agencies, exemplified and embodied in the relationship that Director Kurlikowski and Assistant Attorney General Brewer and I have forged in short order. This is particularly true on the Merida Initiative, the long-term vehicle for expanded cooperation between U.S.-Mexican law enforcement agencies. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Issa, it, it, is, it has been said that the challenge of our time is that the future is not what it used to be. When it comes to U.S.-Mexican relationships and the prospect for building on that cooperation to deal with Mexican criminal organizations, that's a good thing, a very good thing indeed. I look forward to exploring uh, this matter further with you and my colleagues in uh, the question and answer, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Burson, for your uh, testimony. Uh, we now will move to the uh, question and, uh, um, and answer period. Uh, I have a broad question, I guess, for you, uh, Mr. Brewer and uh, Mr. Burson. Are we winning the war against the Mexican cartels? Uh, drug cartels. Are we winning the war against the Mexican uh, drug cartels? Mr. Chairman, we are. That's not to say that we don't have much to do, but if you look at the work that has occurred with the cartels, Mr. Chairman, uh, with respect to operations that we have, whether it's Operation Accelerator, Project Reckoning, where we have uh, systematically gone, investigated, and prosecuted the cartels. We've taken enormous blows 
We, we have uh, extracted enormous blows against the Sinaloa cartel, against the Gulf cartel. We have higher levels of extraditions of drug kingpins than ever before. So we are making very effective, very effective strategies with respect to intelligence-based investigations and prosecutions. That's not to suggest for a moment that we don't have more to do, but the battles among the cartels themselves are showing that the pressure that we're putting on them in, in unison and in alliance with uh, President Calderon and his administration, I think, do demonstrate that, that we are being very effective. Mr. Burson? No. Uh, generally, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I agree with Mr. Brewer that uh, this is a, a long-term struggle about reducing the power of the cartels on the government of Mexico and therefore uh, turning it from what is currently a national security threat uh, into a uh, more conventional law enforcement or criminal justice problem. And measured by that standard, I think we have a ways to go, but I'm in accord with Mr. Brewer that for the reasons that he stated, that we are making uh, progress and that it's measurable progress and that we can, in fact, uh, uh, intensify what we're doing and that we can continue to see a weakening of uh, the cartel power, which now is alarmingly high, as I said in my statement. Yeah. It has been indicated um, that the President is planning to send National Guard troops to the border. Uh, of course, uh, if we send National Guard uh, troops to the border, who will be in charge of them? Uh, Mr. Chairman, the uh, decision whether or not to send National Guard uh, in support of law enforcement at the U.S.-Mexican border, indeed at any border, is a decision uh, reserved exclusively uh, uh, for the President. Secretary Gates and Secretary Napolitano have been conferring uh, and will be developing uh, a recommendation that will be submitted to the President. Uh, but at end, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, the uh, mission, uh, the decision, uh, is, a, uh, is a function of uh, presidential decision, and I'm uh, confident that in due course that decision will be made one way or the other. Right. What are the implications for U.S. national security should the Calderon administration fail in its efforts to take on the Mexican drug cartels? What are the stakes for both Mexico and the United States? Yeah. Mr. Brewer, you want to take it? Uh, you, uh, Mr. Chairman, they're, they're, quite, they're very, very significant. Certainly for Mexico, uh, as uh, Assistant Secretary Burson said, uh, they're confronting a national security uh, uh, tremendous challenge right now in their battle against the cartels. Uh, with respect to us right now, it is absolutely an organized crime. It's the equivalent of a major organized crime challenge. We cannot permit uh, President Calderon to fail. Uh, this may be a once-in-a-generation opportunity, his courage and his willingness to take on the cartels. So the consequences are very extraordinary, and we need to deploy the appropriate resources and skill and collaboration to ensure that we do everything we can to support the President. Yeah. Mr. Burson, I'd like to hear you on that yeah. as well. I, I'm uh, Thank you. in agreement with Secretary Napolitano as having heard uh, her refer uh, to this window of opportunity. Uh, to the extent that we're not able to weaken the influence of the cartels on the Mexican uh, political system, uh, we will continue to see a Mexico that is systematically corrupt in which decisions are not being made on the merits but are rather being made because they're bought and paid for. Uh, that kind of a uh, narco-influenced political system south of the border uh, presents a whole series of long-term uh, security threats to Mexico, which is why it's so important uh, that we uh, use this window of opportunity with the Calderon administration uh, to weaken the power of these criminal organizations, these smuggling organizations that do enormous damage to our society, but uh, even more damage to uh, Mexican society. What would victory really look like? I mean, let's go right down the line. What, what, what would it really look like, victory for us? One of the things that victory in Mexico would look like is certainly that uh, President Calderon has, as we have in this country, a local law enforcement that is professional, highly trained, skilled, possesses the integrity uh, to be responsive to the needs of protecting the people 
rather than uh, the, the heavy use of uh, the military in that country. The other thing that I would uh, look at in Victory too is that, uh, as has been remarked uh, to me by representatives from the government of Mexico, and that is the increasing addiction population or size of the population involved in drug use. As uh, all of the members, I believe, of the committee know, the traffickers often pay their couriers in product rather than in, in currency. Well, then, you return, then you're building up a new clientele base. We in the United States have to be uh, willing and have already looked at uh, providing resources that work toward the prevention end of uh, drug, drug use in that country, but also the treatment end. And those are other parts that we hope to play. All right. I yield to the five minutes to the gentleman from uh, California. Thank you, both. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Burson, uh, during your tenure as U.S. Attorney, uh, you were quite well known for going after the coyotes, literally stopping those who traffic in human beings. Uh, and along the way, you did an awful lot of drug charges that they were involved in and the mules they carried. Can you give us uh, your opinion of current law, particularly 1326, 1324, some of the penalties that you have, or let me rephrase that, that the U.S. Attorney at the border, ha border areas have as tools today, and are they sufficient? M Mr. Reiser, you, uh, you raise an important point, particularly in this uh, era in which the uh, sharp division that used to exist between alien smuggling organizations and drug smuggling organizations has been blurred in part by the uh, efforts Mr. Mr. Brewer described, the pressure being brought on the cartels by U.S. enforcement, but importantly by Mexican enforcement, but also by the recessionary economy. So we begin to see a blurring of those lines. And I, I believe, uh, certainly speaking uh, from the perspective of 10 years ago, the uh, series of uh, statutes av available to prosecutors, and, and I will defer immediately to uh, Mr. Brewer, uh, since I, uh, I wear proudly a former hat uh, as a prosecutor, is that, uh, but as an enforcement uh, official, I would say that uh, 1326 uh, and, and 1325, which of course is a misdemeanor, work well. 1324, uh, which is the penalties for alien smugglers, is something that 10 years ago uh, was believed to require a review, and I, I submit, regardless of of uh, how we, uh, we, we come out on it, it could uh, stand a further review at this point. So, well, and, and Mr. Brewer, basically what, the, what I'm trying to get to is uh, we've had a challenge at the border that I've observed, which is that the first several times that you catch a trafficker, uh, he gets treated almost as an amateur, like he just happened to be stumbling over the border by mistake. It's 60 days and out, time served. Um, the second time isn't much more, and we've had cases of dozens and dozens of times in which we cannot get, uh, some, sometimes because of statute, we can't get the kind of enforcement. Do you believe, all three of you, do you believe that the Congress should be looking into giving you, uh, as prosecutors and the courts in their determination, at least a greater ability to have upper limits be, or have the lower limits raised and or at least give them the ability to have tougher sentences even on the first or second time that you catch a trafficker, regardless of whether you can actually catch him with the drugs. Uh, thank you, Congressman. Um, I definitely think it's an issue that needs to be explored. I think what we need to do is we need to give the tools, particularly to our U.S. Attorney, such as what uh, Secretary Burson was when he was the remarkably effective U.S. Attorney in San Diego. I think we need to give our U.S. Attorneys, particularly in the southwest border states, the discretion and the tools so that they can effectively and comprehensively deal with the issue. But I don't think, candidly, that there's one size fits all. And I think we have to give our U.S. Attorneys in those areas the discretion to prioritize. Because, of course, as we if we're going to charge under one aspect of the law such as this, we have to then ensure that we have appropriate facilities, whether it's prison facilities and other facilities. And well, let me go back through that. Sure. Uh, California has tens of thousands of people who are petty criminals and illegal aliens. Are you saying that if we wanted to incarcerate every coyote, every person who is trafficking either in drugs or in human beings, 
that you don't have the capacity today to incarcerate every single one of those people for a, ser a significant period of time? Uh, I think that the, there would be terrific challenges, uh, um, um, Congressman. I think that to have the appropriate facilities and infrastructure to do that would require a lot. And, and more to the point, as we look at this comprehensive approach, what we really want to do is give our U.S. attorneys the tools so that we can most effectively dismantle the very cartels that you were talking about. But so the only tool a prosecutor really has is the ability to incarcerate. Uh, any tool short of, of that is an alternate. In other words, if you turn on your, the rest of your cartel, we will not lock you up for 10 years. That's a powerful tool. If you turn on your cartel or you're going to spend 60 days in the Huskow, somehow I don't think that's a powerful tool. So the reason I'm asking for this is, is threefold. First of all, should we have it? I think Mr. Burson was more tending to say he wouldn't mind having the stronger tools at his disposal and at the judge's disposal to to use that as a tool of, of, of in order to get cooperation and in many cases incarceration. But the bigger question for us up here is, are we clogging the system with not having comprehensive immigration reform, with not having uh, relations with Mexico that allows us to return more of their citizens sooner with a full faith belief that they will incarcerate them. So although my time has expired and I have to be sensitive to the limited time, I would like it if you'd look at it from that standpoint because we're the Committee on Oversight and Reform and we're the first stop in are there tools you don't have either north or south of the border that we could begin shedding light on. C Congressman, I think you've identified exactly in a, in a very eloquent way the issue. We absolutely, as a component of this, ought to have comprehensive immigration reform. There's just absolutely no question. And secondly, in our building of our relationships with the Mexican government and, and, and President Calderon, a very effective tool, of course, is that we, in certain circumstances, do want to be able to return uh, people to Mexico and know and have confidence that the Mexican government is going to treat them appropriately. So absolutely, those are parts of the puzzle. Thank you very much. And I now yield uh, to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, I, do we fully appreciate the amount of corruption and the depth of the corruption uh, that's involved with, with the large amount of money uh, that is indicated it's involved with this, it's going into Mexico. Uh, and the reports that we see about corruption in the police departments, corruption in the military, corruption in the judicial system, um, what are we doing about, what can we do about that? What are we doing about it? And what confidence do you have that we're going to get a grip on that? Because without taking the profit out of this thing uh, and dealing with that money, we're just spinning our wheels, right? Uh, Congressman, it's an enormous challenge. You're absolutely right. Uh, one of the effective tools that we do have and that we hope to do more of is our ability through Merida and other initiatives to, uh, to work with and train law enforcement in Mexico. We're making great strides with respect to training vetted units, units that we have a lot of confidence in are in fact not uh, subject to bribery, whether it's because they, to be vetted they are subject to polygraphs and, and a kind of background reviews that is you mind if I interrupt you for a second? You're talking about the military as opposed to police there. No, I'm talking about the, police, the police as well. Right. I'm talking about the police. Right. And then, you would agree there's a, a significant amount of fear amongst police officers right there now, no matter how much you train them and how much you give them to pay. You uh, know, I, sometimes either going away or taking the money is a lot better alternative than having your family uh, violated or, or be killed yourself. And that's why it's such an enormous challenge. But there are many courageous law enforcement in Mexico, and these vetted units are a good representation of them. Doubtless, there are a lot of courageous people there. But don't we have to do something about the money, about the cash? I mean, if, if, can we, if we stop the profit, we stop the cash, yeah. we're a long way along on this, I would think. So tell me, what are, we, uh, what are your thoughts about the importance of disrupting uh, the cartel's drug activity by seizing their money? And what are we going to do to do that? Well, well, you're right, and I, I defer to my colleagues here as well. But, of course, what we are doing is, uh, from the law enforcement point of view, and, of course, at the Justice Department, we have unparalleled levels of, of forfeiture and seizure of the of the profits and the the money and and the and the and the the possessions of the cartel members and frankly one of our one of our training programs is to teach and incorporate even in Mexico the same concept of forfeiture and seizure of their but assets. But don't we have to do that back further back the line Mr. Burson? Absolutely. Uh, Congressman uh -oh. the uh, one of the uh, changes that's taken place recently is the frank acknowledgement on our end of the bargain 
that the consumption of drugs in this country that generates through trafficking organizations the kinds of sums of money that have corrupted Mexican politics and its, its legal system is something that will continue uh, until we get a better handle on reducing uh, the, the demand. So how having, are we going to get having, that money have, further up the chain while it's in the United States before it goes south? The, the, uh, with regard to the, the uh, drug demand reduction, the Southwest Border Strategy that was unveiled by the AG, by Director okay. Kurlikowski and the Secretary, place a heavy emphasis on that. It does right. so I see that, but, but there's still, at least in the interim, until we all uh, manage the, to have a heavy effort on that, going to be that the cash. cash and, and the cash going south is, again, another departure that's been made by Secretary Napolitano. Having CBP and the Border Patrol, as well as field office, uh, pay attention to that, so that for the first time, while we had them in the past, we have systematic checks going southbound. And this is a, uh, a project that is very much geared to cooperating with Mexico as it builds up its enforcement capacity again for the first time. I, I guess part of my on comments are that you had a couple of months ago you had some sporadic uh, checks going Correct. southbound. I think much too sporadic to be very effective. And we may not have the infrastructure there to really be effective on that. So, again, you know, what are you going to do about the infrastructure there to make sure that we have a southbound steady yes. impact on that? And then further back the line, because by the time it gets to the border, uh, with the tunnels that I hope to get to in a moment, things of that nature, it's maybe too late. Congressman, you're, uh, you're right that it wasn't uh, until uh, mid-April when the Secretary changed the policy that we went from very sporadic checks to systematic checks from Brownsville to San Diego. Uh, we need to continue to assess the effectiveness of that, and particularly to see this as a bridge to Mexican capacity to conduct its inspections, which it is now building up again, from Matamoros on the east to Tijuana on the west. Uh, we need to assess that, whether or not we should be making a major investment in infrastructure to have two southbound checks, one U.S. and one Mexican, is one that uh, certainly is on the table, but I think we need to learn a lot more about uh, the response and, and is there to this anything action. in the plan about coming further back to the chain before things get to the southwest border? No and, question. And what aggressively are we going to do with that? There is a lot of progress. There are a couple things that are being done besides those increased searches at the border. Uh, they're using local law enforcement to help with that. So in Seattle, we sent uh, officers trained with canines along with the sheriff's department and others at the request of the federal government. All of these local law enforcement agencies across the country are more than willing to do their part to help. That's only one part. The other, the high-intensity drug trafficking areas, they're in 28 places around the United States. Their mission is to disrupt and dismantle those drug trafficking organizations. Often they have the roots in Mexico. They not only uh, uh, seize the drugs, make the arrests, work with federal prosecutors or local prosecutors, but they also go after the funds and the money. So you're not just stopping the bulk cash at the border, you're stopping the bulk cash in Seattle and California and other places. Uh, uh, and there is progress. There's more training being done in that. In Treasury, FinCEN is working very hard under the new credit card uh, act uh, to develop ways of looking at the, uh, the use of just a card that's going to carry thousands of dollars of cash. Uh, there's a lot more to be done, but there's a lot of progress on that front. Choking off the money is the key. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Quigley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, um, I know the issue of the National Guard was raised broadly earlier. Uh, is it accurate there are about 500 National Guardsmen on the southwest border as, as we speak? Uh, there, there are a, uh, a complement of National Guard that have been engaged in an uh, ongoing uh, project that's been in existence for more than two decades uh, in support of uh, law enforcement activities. And I believe that uh, that, uh, that number is, uh, is, uh, is one that I need, to, I need to confirm. I do know that uh, most of the uh, Guardsmen are actually away from the border engaged in uh, intelligence, uh, a analytical activities, uh, and the like. But I'll need to uh, uh, confirm whether it's 400 or some smaller number that are actually physically on the border today. Well, two follow-ups. The first would be the, the activities that they're completing as you talk about. Do they relate to these drug cartel activities? The counter-drug uh, 
program that's been in existence for uh, two decades and that I'm very familiar with from my time as a, uh, a prosecutor in the 90s uh, is definitely counter-drug in nature. That's the basis that Congress has authorized the activity. And uh, these are activities that uh, involve supporting uh, law enforcement in a variety of ways uh, that are consistent with the division between law enforcement and the military that served uh, <clears throat> this country well over the years. Um, you've probably read about the press accounts that discuss the possibility of the administration increasing this number of National Guardsmen perhaps to another 1,500. Is, it, is that your understanding, or is that still in the planning stage? This is all in the, uh, in the uh, discussion stage, uh, as I indicated, Congressman, between Secretary Napolitano, Secretary Gates, and uh, together they intend to make a joint recommendation uh, to the President who, will, uh, who retains and will make the final decision. Okay, and excuse me if this has been discussed, because we're between votes and two committees here, but uh, we have had in previous hearings, such as this, discussions about the conflicts between DEA and IC, ICE, uh, and I understand there has been an agreement that was signed on this. What exactly was the problem and how does this solve it, do you, and do you sense that it is solving that issue? Uh, well, well, what it shows, uh, Congressman, is the issue with ICE and DEA. They just entered into a memorandum of understanding. I think it's fair to say that there is a remarkable commitment to work together and, and that, that they, in fact, have been working well together. But now what happens is that ICE and DEA can work together. Uh, ICE agents can be designated to per pursue uh, drug-related crimes that are border-related, but they can do that throughout the, the country. And very importantly, the information that ICE gathers in its investigations can be shared in one of our remarkable uh, data fusion centers so that all of the information from ICE and DEA and other law enforcement is shared together so it comprehensively and effectively can be used to go after the cartels. And there's perhaps an information loop that will follow back to make sure that that continues to be the case? There is, and there is a, a, a great commitment. There's a very great commitment by DEA and ICE, uh, Homeland Security, and the Department of Justice to ensure that that will happen, and I'm quite confident it will. Congressman, on the second panel, you'll have a, uh, a working agent from Immigration Customs Enforcement from D, uh, DHS who I think will speak very directly to your uh, Okay. Your, your uh, inquiry. And Assistant uh, Director Placida from the DEA can as well. Congressman. Um, time permitting, I guess the third point being the, we often hear this figure that 90 percent of the guns confiscated in this conflict come from the United States. Uh, given that we're not necessarily tracing all those guns, perhaps a fraction of them, how are we determining that figure? Well, well I, I think, Congressman, there, the, the, the precise number may be a little bit hard to identify. It's, of course, you're absolutely right. Of, of those guns recovered for which one can trace them, I think that number that you have identified is the number that has, uh, that has been um, said, and I think that's right. I think the larger issue is that it is inescapable that a very large percentage of the guns that are in Mexico today do in fact come from the United States. And as we together are, are joining with our friends in Mexico to combat the battle, um, that's one of the issues that we all have to confront here ourselves. Why aren't more guns traced? Is it just because some of them are untraceable or just the volume makes it difficult for ATF to trace? Well, Congressman, I, um, I, what may work is in the second panel, Billy Hoover of uh, okay. ATF is here, and he can in a much uh, more cogent manner than I explain some of the intricacies there. But, of course, when possible, uh, a good number of them have been traced, but I think he'll be in a better position than I to tell you some of the challenges that ATF has found. And I appreciate that, and we'll, we'll have a second panel. And, Mr. Chairman, I just in closing, I suppose it would be easier to uh, control that if we continue what the Clinton administration did, which was a ban on semi-automatic semi weapons. It's, it's a, a lot easier to control them if they're not being sold. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentlewoman from Washington, D.C. Well, I'd like to pick up where the gentleman left off. Uh, I was frankly embarrassed. Um, 
by the performance of our country when the episodes, terrible episodes uh, of armed conflict, um, some thought might even bring down the government that may have been somewhat exaggerated. Here was the president trying to fight the gun cartels and guess who was supplying the guns? And turns out um, um, not only were, are we not configured to find these guns, even with the, the most elementary in, in inspection uh, capacity, uh, but Keystone cop fashion, when we check, when we did a sporadic, uh, some sporadic outbound inspections, they just <laughs> looked at where you were doing them and got their guns out anyway. Um, the notion that this country would have been so central to the supply of guns when the when, which which was in, were in such plentiful supply that it was like an army that the the government itself was up against not just a bunch of thugs they had so much weaponry um, I'm far more interested, so we know we're not doing much once you get guns. We know it doesn't take much to get them to Mexico. I'm far more interested in how these thugs so easily pick up guns in this country and whether these guns are being sold. Um, is this Assistant Attorney General Brower? Is that your name, sir? Brewer. 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 Um, how you could pick up large catch of guns, equip yourself as if you were an army with such force that the government <laughs> Uh, for a while there, was essentially fighting an internal army supplied in no small part by the United States of America. Now, where do these guns come from? Uh, how are they able to pick them up in such large numbers? How are they able to get out what amounts to enough guns to arm a virtual small army, uh, many of them from the United States, and regardless of the figures and the, and the notion that, well, a lot of them came from X, Y, or Z. You know exactly where they came from, Mr. Brewer. And while you might not be able to trace them, you have law enforcement jurisdiction in the United States of America. And why are you not keeping these guns from being either bought or otherwise um, in such large numbers uh, so that they now arm a, arm a small army in another country? It is extremely embarrassing. And Mexico has been, I think, very, very <laughs> kind uh, to us. I would have been very, very angry at the big kahuna in the north that was essentially shipping down arms to kill my people while they won't do anything about its own assault weapon ban, while nobody in your administration even spoke out about illegal guns and uh, the proliferation of guns in, in our country, except the Attorney General did say something about it. And so it looks like all you got to do is get some guns uh, and <laughs> you'll get them across the border very easily, and nobody in the United States is doing very much to keep thugs from acquiring those guns in the first place. I'm interested in this country, what you're doing here before you get to the border. Well, well Congresswoman, I, I, um, I share your, your concern. 
I want to begin by saying that there are people who are working very hard. Our ATF agents are doing an extraordinary job with their resources, Congresswoman. Well, are they, what, what are they doing? Who's well, selling the guns? Well, who is selling the guns, sir? Who, well, where are the guns coming from? Well, I think they're coming from a lot of places, Congresswoman. I think they're coming from um, licensed firearm dealers where you have straw purchasers and um, the power of these cartels is extraordinary, and they, as you know, their, their, their reach is great, and so we have to dismantle those cartels. But some are coming from licensed firearm dealers, some on the southwest border. Is there nothing so, you can do about those coming well, from licensed? Well, our ATF agents are doing a lot, but they have limited resources, Congresswoman. What are they, they doing? Well, what are they doing? They're visiting the license. They're going to these licensees. They're they're doing inspections. Our, our are they doing any undercover work? You know? Yes, they are, Congresswoman. They're doing a lot, and they're sharing it with lots of agencies. So it's not fair to be critical of our agents. With the resources that they have, they're doing extraordinary jobs, and every day they're serving the American people well. I'm it's, not critical. Yeah. I'm, I'm critical of your leadership, sir. I don't know about your agents. I, I love the ATF. Well, I'm talking I about... What it takes to dismantle the 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 gun cartel in this country right. that I, is that is not only enabling but making possible. The well, gentlewoman's time has expired. Um, let me first thank you um, for your testimony, and uh, again apologize for the delay. Uh, but you know, I, I'm just wondering if uh, you could we we'll hold the record open. If you could get some information for us, you know, uh, the arrest rate, which seems to be very aggressive in terms of what's happening in Mexico, but could you get us some information on the convictions? You know, it's, it's one thing to make a lot of arrests, but I want to know in terms of if we could get some information in terms of the percentage in terms of uh, convictions, you know, uh, we appreciate it. We'll hold the record open for Absolutely. It. Right. And lengths of and, well, then, that's a good point, too. Yeah, length of sentences as well. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, so we will hold the record open for that information. Right. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. Yes. Now we'll bring up our second panel, Mr. Anthony P. Placido, Mr. Kumar Kibble, Mr. Todd Owen. Is that it? Mr. William Hoover and Mr. Robert McBrien. Boy, 